right, I guess we can get started. Can everyone hear me okay? The uh, grumbles if you can't. So uh, the acoustics in this area uh, leave a little bit to be desired. We are gonna have a talk going over the, on there in about 30 seconds. Uh, it's about web audio, and I believe Dolby's over there. So I'm assuming at some point we're gonna have some issues. So when it starts up, we'll just respect them, we'll quiet down, look at each other awkwardly, and then reconvene as soon as it, it ends. Um, so thank you very, very, very much for coming. Uh, I'm actually surprised at how many people are here because this is probably the most boring name for a talk I could have imagined at this conference. It's a bit esoteric, but uh, I think my role here is to get you to become emotionally invested in your source code as data and trying to understand what other things you can do with it uh, instead of just reading it as text. So, who here loves Browserify? Yeah. Who here has uh, uh, interesting issues with Browserify? Good, all right, there's about the same people. Um, has anyone dissected the guts of Browserify and understand? Oh, you guys can't see the gray at all. So there's a lot of gray there. We're, this might be a, an issue as we go on, so I'll try to explain it in depth. If you, if you checked out the slides uh, in advance, then maybe you can help your partners uh, who are sitting right next to you. So this would be a slide of some Jake uh, Browserify stuff, but the important stuff is the highlighted portion anyway. So what Browserify does is it bundles up your JavaScript uh, as text, wraps it in functions, provides it require module exports, which uh, then Browserify's injected code deals with instead of Node. So the important part about this is that the code is statically analyzed to find the require calls, and then those files are bundled up in the end, uh, end file as, so that they are available to the code when it executes. So this is uh, very different than Node. When Node deals with uh, require statements, it stops execution of your program, finds the file or the module is referenced by that string, and then provides it as an object to your, your calling code. And Browserify, it has to have access to everything up front. <coughs> so the first part we saw that our code was actually there, var jQuery equals require jQuery. Second part right here is the entirety of jQuery, and at the end is uh, the module ID that is, gets sent to Browserify in order to kick off the whole thing. <coughs> So transfer transformations are occurring on your code and third-party code. It's not just being the run the same way you write it. Transformation is also not really a good term uh, because it doesn't accurately convey the complexity of what is going on behind the scenes. Just not just a few file reads, greps, and concatenations. It's it's not transformation is not something source code just does. You can't just press a button and have it magically transform into something else. It, it's something. It's more akin to genetic modification. Uh, extreme analysis and understanding the problem space combined with splicing, injection, and deletion. So again, this is, now that we're relatively familiar with Browserify for people who haven't played with the internals, uh, we now know what this will do. Can anyone guess what this might do? And if, if your uh, guess is nothing, that's a pretty good guess. Uh, it's not too complicated though, it's a comment, we can just look for strings that start with double slashes and not parse those. But of course, there are a bunch of edge cases that exist in JavaScript where we can't do exactly that, so we have to have more advanced parsing. <coughs> Anyone uh, figure out what this might do? Obviously, again, nothing. The point of all this, we're gonna get through this really quickly. This is not a Browserify talk. This is trying to outline the complexities of actually dealing with JavaScript as text. So this, given that we know uh, Browserify statically analyzes your source code in order to find the require calls, what do you think it might do with this? Has anyone run into an issue along these lines in their Browserify code? Browserify doesn't know what you're requiring because it's not able to do the data flow analysis necessary to find out what's going to be in the variable module, so it's just not going to require anything at all. <coughs> so he here loves ES6, or ES 2015 if you're one of those people. Everyone, raise their hands. So Babel is an excellent transpiler. Uh, Sebastian does a ridiculous job at adhering to specification and does a lot of transfor transformations based off of individual elements of ES6 spec. So this is, that's, you're not gonna see punch punctuation very well at all, are you? That is an arrow function up there. Can I change my, does anyone know the shortcut for changing my, uh, inverting the colors on, an, on a Mac display? No? All right, so Babel will do something like transpile an arrow expression into the appropriate function expression depending on how you're trying to use that arrow expression. So uh, 
interesting issues arise when you start using this or arguments or new dot target. Those are not something that can be instantly translated to a function expression. So Babel will uh, find out that you're using this expression or something else in your function expression and then assign those to temporary variables outside the, in the parent scope so that you can use them inside the function expression. So obviously Babel is far more complex and this sort of transformation, yeah. Command, alt, function F5. <laughs> Hold on, let's see if this works. Yeah, yeah thank you. <clears throat> All right, so that is an arrow expression. All right, so now let's say, oh, this, this is going to get very interesting later on. All right, let's say you wanted to tweak your code just a little bit. Um, now, this is obviously a contrived example for the space of a, of a talk at HTML5 DEF CONF, but let's, let's try to extrapolate on our own for our own code to find out things that we might want to do. So let's say, for example, we want to refactor uh, foo calls uh, with A and B as arguments to bar calls of B and A. Uh, sure, there are tools that'll help you with that right now, but what if you could do that yourself? And now I can see what some of you are thinking, or what I imagine some of you might be thinking. You got regular expressions. It's not really worth it to learn something new just for this weird edge case. <laughs> now, has anyone looked at regular expressions and think, ah, I don't really need to learn about regular expressions. I've got basic text search and that's going to be fine. Now, that may not be actually that common because it's easy to see the value of regular expressions up front. A trivial regular expression can do something that a text search cannot possibly do. Now, this scenario you're faced with would be technically possible with a regular expression, but just phenomenally difficult. How difficult? So now let's say we want to just capture the call expression foo uh, and the arguments. We'll do argument parsing later. Now it starts off easy enough, but now we have to actually have to deal with the arguments and this gets ra this rapidly gets longer, but if you look at it, this is not actually that, more, that much more complex. But of course we need to support Unicode and that's gonna add some complexity. We need to start uh, supporting numeric literals being passed because let's say foo takes an integer as the first argument. Uh, it's not really that big of a deal. It's not too crazy yet. We support multiple arguments. It gets a little bit, long, long, little bit longer. We also have to account for the fact that there might be a space between the call and the parentheses because, you know, you, just in case anyone on your team actually did that. Uh, we also do not want to match uh, other foo. So let's, uh, let's just assume that any word boundary at the start is good enough. Uh, we also pipe pass string literals which get coerced to integers inside the code. So we have to take care of that. And then we actually might just also uh, throw full complex expressions there, and this is where I stop desiring uh, building you a uh, working regex. Um, but it's easy to assume that something can be done with regular expressions, and then as you start trying, it quickly becomes something you either do by hand, uh, you do a search on your file system, and you find all the uh, cases of something, and then you fix it by hand, or you just don't ever refactor your code. So now using something like ESQuery, which is a tool that allows you to query an S JavaScript abstract syntax tree, <coughs> we could do something like this. I probably don't even really need to explain really what's happening here. It should be relatively obvious. We're looking for something that is being called with a name of foo. <coughs> you don't even need to worry about the arguments in this case because since we're matching an actual node of a tree, all the children of that subtree are, are available to us when we have that node. All right, so far we've seen some popular tools that do some magic with JavaScript, and we've explored how unrealistic it would be to actually use just simple text and regex searches. So what is an ASD? An ASC is an abstract syntax tree, and really what it boils down to is that it's just a data structure that represents your source code that you've written. So each of the nodes represents elements that you are already using on a daily basis. You write code, you know what it's doing, presumably, all those uh, syntactic elements are just represented as nodes in a syntax tree. So they might sound different, they might have names that you might not have heard before, but it's all the exact same stuff you do on a daily basis. So there's really nothing scary here except for the names, but as soon as you learn those, then you're gonna be conversing with people more accurately, you're gonna be seeing patterns emerge in your source code, and it's not gonna be that difficult to start just thinking about your code as data. So, the rest of this talk, we're gonna go through how you might get a JavaScript AST. Uh, how you're going to use it, how you might you transform it, what does the transformation actually mean, and at the end we're going to build a simple transpiler. Uh, it's, it's not nearly uh, a Babel scale, but it is something that definitely works. It transpiles something and definitely will put you on the path to doing more advanced transformations. 
So parsing JavaScript. These are a few of the major parsers that are out there. There are actually a lot of parsers, and it's less the parser that's important. It's the AST format that it generates that binds you to an ecosystem. <coughs> So Esprima uh, is one of the leaders out there, written by Ari Hedia. Uh, it's, it's very fast. It's very conservative in what it implements. Uh, there are other parsers like Acorn, which were parsing uh, ES6 syntax much earlier, but then as the spec changes, uh, backwards compatibility breaks. Esprima is very conservative that way. It will only implement something that is uh, definitively stable within the spec. So Esprim and Acorn parse to ES3 format. It's also a shift parser, which is the most spec compliant, which is less really than, it's less important for uh, probably people like you who, are, who know your own code, uh, probably writing reasonable code, you're not doing anything crazy to it, but it's a good alternative for uh, tools that might need to operate on any JavaScript, because then you have to account for as much possible JavaScript as can technically run. So the two standardized AST formats, uh, two major standardized AST formats, uh, ES3 uh, and Shift. So ES3 is largely a community effort which stemmed from the SpiderMonkey AST. SpiderMonkey AST was released in 2010 by Mozilla. Uh, it existed, they released an API to it. Um, it's a, an artifact of the SpiderMonkey interpreter and it's got wide, wide tool support. It's been around for a long time. It has its issues. ES3 uh, has made a lot of those issues better but it still tries to retain a bit of backwards compatibility. Shift is a shape security open source product, um, also written by the person who wrote Esprima, Ari Hidia, and the person who wrote uh, the CoffeeScript compiler, Michael Ficarra. Um, disclaimer, I work at shape security, I work with these people. Uh, it has have limited tool support, largely because of its age. Uh, it's not compatible with ES3. Uh, it's cross-platform, meaning that right now there is a JavaScript and Java implementation of it, and people have written implementations in other languages. It's the first spec-based AST meaning that the AST was the first consideration when it was being developed. All the nodes, uh, or all the, the, the elements within ES5 and ES6 were considered before building the tree. Um, so with uh, the limited tool support, incompatibility, um, and being that it's owned by a company, essentially, uh, why would you ever use Shift? Well, first off, jump to the bottom. When in doubt, use ES3. Don't use Shift just because you heard me talk about it. Use ES3, the community is great. There's awesome people there. Wow, we are active in that community as well. Shift exists uh, largely for more efficient and easier transformation and analysis code. There are a lot of uh, peculiarities with SpiderMonkey and they have been extended to ES3 that make it uh, so that you have to account for a lot of edge cases in the, in the abstract, abstract syntax tree and Shift was explicitly designed to reduce those as much as possible. <clears throat> so, when you have a parser, this is all you do. And you uh, give it a string, you get a giant blob of data back. Now this AST object is just a plain old JavaScript object. There is nothing strange about this whatsoever. Uh, there's no peculiar methods, there's no instance objects, it's just a plain old JavaScript object, it could be JSON. And none of us here is scared of JSON, right? You can use a tool like uh, Felix Kling's AST Explorer. Um, if you just Google AST Explorer, you'll find this, which allows you to visualize the ASTs that are generated by any one of these parsers. And there's also a lot of ready-made traversal tools and helping tools so that you don't actually have to worry about tree traversal. So there's a few up there. ES Traverse is a great one. Uh, Esprima Walk and AST Traverse are a few others. And there are many, many more Esprima and ES3 based traversers and tools out there. The two at the bottom, Shift Traverse and Shift Traverse and Shift Reducer, are basically the only two that I know of for Shift uh, ASD. So, how would you transform an ASD? Let's say we want to uh, transform the identifier A to B. It's relatively simple. First, we have to see what the tree actually looks like. Here we can see a root node of script. Uh, root node may be either script or module, which is something that as these things get implemented in browsers, we'll all probably start uh, seeing a little bit more. Um, we have a list of statements that exist in that script or module. Here we just have a variable declaration statement. Uh, we have a, a let variable, a variable declaration of type let, and we have a number of declarators there. Well, one declarator, the first one here being uh, something that binds the literal numeric expression to the identifier A. So to change that, all we do is import our parser from shift parser, uh, import our code generator from shift code gen. So a code gen, there's also ES code gen, all we do is pass it an AST and it produces JavaScript. 
So here we parse our JavaScript, and then we just change the property that we want to change, and then we generate new JavaScript source code. It's about the easiest possible thing that you could do. <coughs> All right. So now that we've gone through what an ASD is, how to transform it, how do you, how do you use some of the tools available for, available for it, let's actually build a transpiler. So when building something that transforms code, you have to figure out what you're actually meaning to test first. When building a transpiler, you could test that the output tree is exactly what you're expecting, but really what's important about a transpiler is that the code that is generated executes the way you'd expect in an environment that you're targeting. So in this case, we want to make sure that if we write this code and run it in an ES5 environment, and by run I mean transpile and eval, then it will produce two. So here, um, and it, for those familiar with uh, ifies, I, I, F, E, immediately invoked function expressions, this is very similar, except it would be an immediately invoked arrow expression in E, I, E. And the call at the end is just calling that. So we want to make sure that when we run this, it produces two. So we're going to use one of the traversal tools that are available for shift, shift reducer. Um, there was a hand way back there. That wasn't intended for me, was it? All right. So shift reducer uh, is just like array.prototype.reduce, but for giant shift ASDs. It operates very much the same way. Uh, you get the, the previous state and the current state, and it bubbles everything up so that you're left with one new value. In the case of a transpiler, we're probably going to want to end up with another AST. And in the case of our transpiler, it's going to be largely the same AST that we started with, with, with some slight changes. So it's not going to be reducing it to any sort of small value. It's going to be reducing it to something about the same size as we started with. To use the shift reducer, uh, import it, you npm install shift reducer, and that produces a reduce function. It also gives you a few uh, reducers that you can inherit from, but we're going to implement our own to show you that there's really no magic going on behind the scenes. So the reduce function, we pass it our reducer that we're going to make and our AST, and we get a resulting AST back, which we can then code gen. So we're going to implement a quick clone reducer. Shift reducer does give you a clone reducer. We're going to implement it in a slightly different way to show you how it's exa exactly done so that you're convinced that there's no magic going on behind the scenes. So one of the benefits of using the shift AST is that we also provide the shift specification so that if you want to automatically generate the code that operates on these nodes, you have uh, the entire specification available to you as code. So this will give you a list of all the nodes that exist, all the fields on all those nodes, any relationships. So here we're uh, creating just an empty object as the reducer, and we are iterating over all the node names in the specification and creating reduce node name functions, which get passed a node and a state, and all they're doing is returning the current state. So now if we use this as our reducer, and we pass in an AST, we're going to get the exact same AST back, which we can then code gen, which is a great place to start when we're transpiling something. <coughs> so the hypothesis here that we're going to be working with is that a function expression at its base is a good place to start when transpiling an error expression. So the error expression that we started with, when we turn it into a function expression and it, we execute it, it should return the value that we want to work with. Make sense so far? So the next step here is to gain insight into what the original AST for the error expression looks like. So the root node here is a module only to show what a module root node looks like. Uh, for most of our cases, there's going to be absolutely no difference in how we use it. So uh, the first item in the program is an expression statement, and that expression is the error expression. This is what we're going to be want to, this is what we're going to want to be working with. <clears throat> now take a look at the other fields in this error expression. There are params and body. So the params is of type formal parameters, and the body is of type function body. <clears throat> Keep those in mind as we go to the next screen. So this is what an AST looks like for a function expression. Compare the values that we were just looking for. So we do have a params and a body, and lucky for us, they are of the exact same types we want, formal parameters and function body. There are a few other properties there, is generator and name, uh, but in a function expression that we're targeting, they are falsy values, so we can probably do okay just ignoring them for now.
good time to take a drink. How's the sound on your side? <laughs> it's getting louder. You guys want to browse Reddit for a little while? All right. What's that? All right, we'll move on. It's getting slower. So this is our uh, reduction function for arrow expressions. Can you guys hear me OK? All right, thank you. So all we're doing is adding a reduce error expression to our reducer object, taking in a node and a state, and all we're doing with that state is changing the type to function expression. We run that, and we get exactly what we wanted, and we find that it executes and returns two. Uh, this is where the inversion's going to start getting uh, entertaining for all of us, and it gets better from here. Uh, so that was very easy, and I can assure you it's not going to get, it's not going to stay that easy, especially for arrow expressions, uh, but for a lot of things, really all you're doing is changing values or creating new objects. So the next step with arrow expressions is that it allows you to just provide an expression instead of a whole function body. So this is our test that we want to make sure that this code, when executed, produces a two. So for those who aren't quite catching on, this is, there's no uh, curly braces around here. It's just an arrow pointing to two, and when you execute that, it's gonna return two. So first, we check that as AST. Notice that we don't have a function body anymore. We just have a literal numeric expression. Uh, now, since a function expression has no concept of just returning an expression itself, we have to make a, our own function body. Now, how would you do that? So first off, remember, what this looked like, we have a function body, we have, the first, uh, we have a list of statements in there, and the first statement that we transpile to is a return statement, which has the same exact expression that we saw in our arrow expression. So here, we have a node type, literal numeric expression, value two, and here, the one that we want to transpile to has that expression just a little bit lower. It seems like a good place for us to wedge our tiny expression in. We just need to reconstruct that function body uh, if it doesn't exist. So, to do that, all we do is actually just check to see whether or not the body type is a function body. If it's not, then we store our current state's body, which is an expression, and we create a new body that looks like a function body. So we have, a direct, we have directives, which we don't need. We have a list of statements. The first statement is a return statement, and the expression of that return statement is the body we started with. So we transpile that, <laughs> and we see that it actually works. So imagine this as uh, colors that were inverted. Um, so this, uh, right now, hopefully you're feeling a similar feeling that he might have felt where you're starting to play with power now. You are now playing with power. For anyone who doesn't actually get that reference, um, then you're probably too young and just swap that with like emojis or something and you'll probably get what we're talking about. So now this is where things get a little bit complicated because this arguments and new.target have some special behavior in error expressions. So we saw Babel at the very, very start assigning this to a temporary variable. This is a very good way to do it uh, because this, this avoids some of the non-standard behavior that we're gonna see the other way. Uh, this is the easy way, which we're going to do largely because of time uh, and I can only put so much code in a slide. Uh, the difference here is that we are going to be uh, generating a function expression that is still operating off a of context. In this way, you'll notice that there is no reference to this in the resulting function expression. That's the behavior we want, because error expressions and bind and other ways to modify the context going in changes significantly with error expressions. So in this case, uh, let's, let's assume that we have a, a global this, we set the value to two, we make an error expression that all it's doing is uh, returning this dot val. We call that error expression, we get a two. Obviously, that's not new. So, but now if we bind that, because we can still bind to error expressions, it just doesn't actually change the context, we would still get two in this case, even though you might expect that we get a six. Now in this case, if we're also at the end, creating a new object with a value of 12, assigning that error expression to a property on that object, and calling that error expression as a member of that object, we are still going to get two instead of the potentially expected 12. Now if we're, using it, if we're gonna do it the cheap way, what we're going to do is be exposing this non-standard behavior so as we change, or as we change the context, or, or how uh, our function expression is called, we're gonna be changing the context that it has access to and is gonna be producing different behavior. That's obviously not ideal, but for this transpiler, we're gonna live with it. <clears throat> so, 
We are transpiling to a function expression. We are getting an error expression. Our error expression is changing that to a function expression, but what we really need now is a call expression. So to do that, we're gonna have to create a call expression, and we do this the same way we've done everything else. We're just creating a new object of type call expression. We have two arguments that we need to worry about, callee and arguments. Callee, well, actually down to the bottom, if, if no one can see that, all it is is a pair of parentheses. Uh, this is gonna show you the part of the generated code that this node is really, can be seen as uh, responsible for. So you have a call expression, all that's really doing is saying that we're gonna have some parentheses somewhere. Now the callee is what is being called. So here, it's a, we're gonna make it a type of static member expression, and don't worry, we'll go over this in more in just a second. Our object is gonna be the state that we're passed in, and the property that we're calling is going to be bind. So let's take a break for a second and explain that a little bit more. So here, we are changed the object to something of type identifier expression with the name of foo. You can think of an identifier expression as just a variable. So what we're doing here is the object that we're accessing is just foo. So if you can't see the bottom, it's just foo.bind and parentheses. So we're calling foo.bind. Next one here, this, uh, we could also do it a, as a computed member expression. So we have ways to statically access members of an object and we have a way to access uh, members of an object based off an expression. So here, if we were to do a commuted member expression, we have our object the same, uh, not highlighted here, but the expression is just a literal st string expression bind. So again, at the bottom, if you cannot see it, it's foo, square bracket, uh, double quotes, bind, double quotes, and square bracket, parentheses. So if we make this a little bit simpler and avoid the uh, member expression syntax at all and just make this a callee of type identifier foo, how can you, you guys okay? All right. Um, then what we have at the bottom is just a call to foo. All right, back to our transpilation and our static member expression. Notice how our object is just the state that we were passed in. So what we're saying is here, we're accessing a member on our function expression. And because we know uh, functions have access to a bind property, it's gonna be our function expression that we're creating, dot bind, and we're calling that. Arguments here are pretty straightforward. It's just gonna be one argument of type uh, this expression. So this expression is uh, special. It's just this. Uh, if we were to, ooh, that's actually, no, I will not do live coding for your sake. You can thank me later. Um, if we did a, a type identifier expression with a name of this, it would generate the same code, but what you parse back is gonna be this expression. So then at the end, what we're doing is uh, returning the call expression that we created. So this is the entirety of our transpiler, which transpiles error expressions to cheap function expressions. Uh, exercise of expanding, expanding this to make better function expressions is less that left up to you. We could talk about this afterward if you want some insight into how that might actually be done. Um, this is how we would use it. So we import our parser from shift parser, we import our reduce function from shift reducer, we import cogen from shift cogen, we import our transpiler from wherever we put our transpiler, and we get our AST by parsing the source, we get our new AST by passing our transpiler and the original AST to the reduce function, and then we cogen our source and we output that, and now we have a uh, mini babble. So, so far we've learned what an AST is, how we can use it, what a transformation looks like, and how we could go about starting to use all these things together to build a transpiler, but now what? So what other things can you do with an ASD? Uh, there's a lot of analysis you can do. Uh, linting, uh, anyone uh, familiar with ESLint? Anyone love ESLint? Uh, prefer, pref, uh, preferred over other uh, linters? So ESLint is fantastic because it exposes a lot of its APIs to you, so you can write your own rules that operate on the code that you want to write. So if you uh, have knowledge of the ES3 format, you can write code that operates on the nodes as they're seen, so you can lint things the way you want to lint them. Uh, you can also uh, analyze the complexity. You can also automatically generate documentation based off of how your code actually works. Uh, you could implement some sort of type checking. Now, if you have the, the logic associated with the auto-generating documentation, you have the type checking, then you can also verify that you're conforming to the APIs that you want to conform to. Now, transformation, it's, it's endless. Here are some examples. Uh, you can transpile, you can generate code. 
uh, that you need to generate for whatever particular case. You don't need to write code anymore. Write code that writes code for you. You can pre-process your JavaScript, uh, easily refactor, reformat. So this is a quote um, from uh, beloved American actor John Stamos during an episode of the early 90s sitcom Full House. Now it's, a, it's extreme, and I don't think I would take it that far if I were him, but he makes a solid point. So plain text is a good base format for writing and reading source code, but it ends there as just being something that's convenient. <clears throat> so a valid source code is made up, made up of all the atomic elements that we've been, we've been talking about so far. They have relationships with their, with their surroundings, they have dependencies that aren't described in text. So when composed in this ab abstract syntactic concert, they convey a lot more meaning than their text alone. So when have you ever typed a function with an opening curly brace that didn't also have an ending curly brace? Why would you? Right? There's, there's no real reason to do that. It's not going to be valid source code if you try to parse it. Why are you responsible for adding that curly brace? Why do you have to add the curly braces whatsoever? Have you ever had arguments with your coworkers about how to format your code, whether or not your curly brace is at the start or the next line? Have you ever wondered at the end of the day, who gives a fuck? When have you ever been concerned about the string T-I-O-N space G-R-E-E-T open parens T-A-R? Probably never, uh, mostly because you would probably not write a greet function in your business logic. Uh, but our concerns with source code are isolated into these atomic units that represent individual components of that language. They may be dependent on one another and they may be extremely heavily coupled, but our concerns are at the boundaries of the code. We're never really worried about the middle. Treating it as text is just an artifact of, of history. More fun stuff. Now, if, if you look at this long enough and probably look away at like a dark wall, you'll see the green and black that you're expecting. So when you start to see your source code more uh, than text, then you start easily recognizing different patterns. You're able to write code that is more amenable to transformation, to analysis, to refactoring, uh, to, uh, to code that works better for you instead of just looks better in a text format. So this is JavaScript on the web. The web is extremely difficult to code. It gets more complex by the year. We need tools that make our lives easier. So it's a complicated environment and it, it is not easy to work with. There are numerous uh, frameworks, build tools, uh, anything else that you need. St you could start by trying to fill your toolbox with more than just frameworks and build tools. Fill it with tools that allow you to take control of the code that you're writing. So when your code, your code will become easier to manage when you no longer have to manage it. If you're writing code, if you have an IDE that is able to work with you on the syntactic elements of your source code, it's gonna be a lot easier to reason about and write your code. Uh, you guys use source control, presumably? CVS probably is the hot one today? Why is it that the majority of our source control is operating on our source code as text? When we change the name of a function or we change a whole block of code, wouldn't it make more sense for it to, for it to compare how that code operates in the environment we're targeting than just diffing against text? There are some source control that do a, a little bit of ways like this, but it's not nearly as advanced as we could get. So, that's all I have right now. Uh, Thank you very much. I genuinely appreciate you coming out to this talk. I'd love to answer any questions or go over any more examples in depth up front here. Um, so, any questions? Uh, yes. So the question was, uh, what resources would I recommend uh, to use to jump into this? Um, there's the, uh, it depends on how much you want to get into this. You could uh, subscribe to ES Discuss, which is a mailing list for, the, for spec related discussions uh, and uh, TC39 issues. TC39 is the board that manages JavaScript or ECMAScript proper. Um, there's the ES Tree uh, organization on GitHub. There's a lot of good discussions there. Uh, there's the, if you're interested in shift stuff, there's shift dash, 
shift-ast.org, which has examples of, actually, I think I have that up, has examples of uh, code generator and parsers and validators and everything else. There's Esprima's website, which is probably esprima.com, uh, which has a bunch of example uh, tools and libraries out there, uh, a bunch of demos, uh, a bunch of articles from ARIA. There's uh, the ES Tools GitHub organization, which has a bunch of uh, uh, Esprima and ES3 related tools. Uh, so you can find out what good uh, traversers and other uh, assistive tools exist out there. Um, as ES Discuss on Twitter, which I believe is still active, which, which will tell you the, the popular topics in the ES Discuss list. Any other questions? Yeah. She just wanted me to put up the bit.ly URL again. Uh, bit.ly slash h5dc, html5 developer conf, uh, dash javascript dash asd. Yeah. Any other questions? So he just uh, said that if, if I post that on Twitter, and I will be sure to do that. Yes. Uh, if, so the question was, the question was uh, the most CPU intensive part of this process? Time consuming? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the parsers are made to be extremely fast. Uh, that's obviously all relative to how much you're parsing. Um, I, I, would have to, I would have to do some benchmarks to find out exactly where the, the most expensive part is. Any other questions? Cool, thank you very much everyone.